So my name is Linda Schott, and I'm an assistant professor, professor and extension specialist at the University of Idaho. And I'm going to talk about a literature review that myself and a postdoc researcher that I had, Jennifer Yost, did. Um, it's been published, uh, it was published at the beginning of last year, um, and we'll have that in some additional resources if anyone is interested. So we did a comprehensive literature review of research data on the impacts of swine manure on soil health properties because um, there was not a lot of information that was applicable to agricultural producers, specifically pork producers. Um, uh, this was a call by the National Pork Board to do this literature review because they knew they saw a need for further research in the area of the impact of swine manure on soil health properties, but needed to know the science of, you know, the state of science of where we started. So globally, pork, when compared to beef and chicken, has the highest production and consumption in in the world. And so it's crucial for researchers, pork producers, and their advisors to recognize the effect of swine manure on soil health. It's really important for the industry and also for researchers and to, to be able to talk about manure as it relates to soil health. There have been plentiful previous research studies and several literature reviews about the effect of manure on individual soil properties. Um, but the conclusions drawn from these reviews and individual studies are a little bit conflicting. And while there have been several literature reviews, they tend to bunch together all types of manure. And swine manure, in general, swine manure can be handled a little bit differently than, let's say, I mean, cattle beef manure, which is, tends to be treated as a solid. And so there are some species differences as well. And so we wanted to do a really directed literature review. The objectives of this study um, were to synthesize the literature describing impacts of swine manure on, you know, quote, soil health, and I'll explain what that looked like. And then the second objective that's going to pop up is to identify knowledge gaps and research needs for further understanding on this topic. Um, so we use several data sources, Google Scholar, Web of Science, because there's a you know, some different journals that are correlated with these data sources. We had several criteria. They needed to be replicated field experiments. So we did not look at greenhouse experiments. We did not look at, you know, lab experiments with incubation of soil. We just did replicated field experiments. Manure had to be the only differing factor between or among studies. And really this only impacted studies that looked at organic agriculture versus conventional agriculture, because in those situations, there tended to be, you know, in the organic treatment, there was manure and a cover crop and um, maybe a different crop. And then in the conventional, it was synthetic fertilizer, no, um, no cover crop and a different cropping type. So that was really the only kinds of studies that were eliminated because we needed to know the impact of just the manure. And then also these papers had to have real data that we could pull. So the data means of swine manure amended treatments and control. Um, we were not looking to try and gather this information off of a graph. Um, and some of the data we collected was soil property data that fit into chem chemical, physical, and biological. And I'll kind of split that out a little bit and show some results. In total, there were 41 peer-reviewed studies that kind of fit in this criteria. 20% of the studies were in North America and 33% were in South America. Um, and then the rest were split up between Asia and Africa um, and Europe. 70% were published between 2011 and 2020, and the oldest was published in 1981. So the majority were have been published, you know, within the last 10 to 15 years. Um, the majority included liquid swine manure. 30% um, of the studies looked at solid um, swine manure. And there was just a couple each on compost and, you know, deep pack or litter and then lagoon effluent. The majority were that liquid swine manure. So in this first graph, we're looking at the on the y-axis, the percent change in soil organic carbon. Um, the majority of the papers reported chemical properties. Actually, 50% looked at 
pH, 25% of the paper, so 10 of them, reported some sort of carbon, so carbon, organic matter, or total carbon. And I'm just going to show the soil organic carbon in this one. Um, that percent change in soil organic carbon is in comparison to the control. And often the control in all of these papers were no amendment added, so no inorganic fertilizer or no um, manure at all. So nothing was added. And we can talk a lot about whether or not that's a fair comparison, but I won't get into that. But as you can see, um, inorganic fertilizer is the IF uh, for the amendment type. And then there's liquid swine manure, swine manure, and manure plus inorganic fertilizer. And when you had swine manure as a solid, or the swine manure plus inorganic fertilizer, you had the greatest increase in soil organic carbon. Um, what was really interesting is that if you compare the inorganic fertilizer to the liquid swine manure, there was no difference in treatment means. So that liquid swine manure really was not increasing soil organic carbon, which is surprising from the standpoint of there is some carbon, but also not that surprising because swine manure treated as a liquid does not have that much um, organic matter in it. What was interesting about this next one is if you looked at um, if it was surface applied or incorporated, it the means were not different. Um, it didn't matter carbon wise if you incorporated that manure or not. And then on the next graph, this just looks at the duration of the application. So less than five years, all the way up to 30 to 40 years. And you can see the longer these studies happened or the more manure that was added, the greater the increase in organic carbon. That also makes sense. Um, and you can see that less in, in less than five years, there was no difference in soil organic carbon. Um, you know, it was pretty much zero. You needed greater than five years. And then on the last graph, this just looked at the change in organic carbon by soil texture. And there was a greater increase mean wise um, in medium textures, so silty, silty loams or silty soils compared to fine textures like clay. Um, but that also could be due to the number of studies that were included in this. There were much, there were a lot more studies that had clay versus that um, medium textured soil. We're just going to talk really briefly about soil nitrogen. So there were also about 10 papers each that looked at some form of nitrogen. And we're just going to talk about the total soil nitrogen. So if you look at, again, it's the, those same um, x-axis things. There wasn't a ton. There was a slight increase when you used liquid swine manure versus an inorganic fertilizer. Um, and there was a slightly larger increase if you use swine manure um, as a solid, and then a huge increase in total nitrogen when you did manure and inorganic fertilizer. And this makes sense. A lot of these studies were not balanced on nitrogen. And so when it says manure plus inorganic fertilizer, both were added. Um, so that the inorganic fertilizer was added in addition to the manure. And oftentimes that inorganic fertilizer treatment gave the full amount of nitrogen that that crop needed. So it was in addition to whatever extra nitrogen was in that manure. And so on the next graph, unlike the carbon, it does matter if that manure was incorporated or not, which also makes sense. If you just surface apply swine manure, you are going to lose, or any manure, you're going to lose a lot of that nitrogen to volatilization. Um, that's not to say there wasn't an increase. There was about a 10% increase in so total nitrogen when you surface applied, um, but then it bumped up to an 18% increase when it was incorporated. On the next one, um, you can see that there's not a lot of information on this graph because a lot of the studies that looked at carbon did not also look at nitrogen. And so there were not that many studies that looked at nitrogen increases in the long term. But you can see that between less than five years and 10 to 20 years, there was an increase with those repeated additions. Um, but unlike the carbon, there was an increase in nitrogen in that less than five year time frame. And then on the final graph, um, there was no difference in change in total nitrogen in the medium versus that fine texture. And so if we go on to this next slide. It's a table, it's a little bit messy, but if we click one more time, there's one component I wanna talk about. 
So there were only 35% of the papers, so 15 reported bulk density, and six papers or less had another physical property like available water capacity, um, permanent wilting point, field capacity, saturated hydraulic conductivity, or aggregate stability. So we could not do that really nice meta-analysis that we were able to do with the carbon and nitrogen. Um, instead, we kind of did this on the table. And so right now we're looking at the soil structure and water is what I'm calling it. Um, so if you look at this study that is in black, this study was really nice. It was with liquid swine manure at um, six different rates compared to a no amendment control. So no fertilizer added at all. Um, and they were all surface applied, but they did it on two different soil textures. And what was really interesting is we're looking at available water holding capacity and on that silt loam, so that medium textured soil, there was a decrease in available water, water holding capacity at all, um, at all rates of manure that were added, but an increase on that coarse soil texture, the sandy loam. And so really it shows that soil type really drives the impact of the effect of manure on these properties. And this is really interesting because a lot, I mean, I'm in this boat myself, we talk a lot about how manure is going to improve soil structure and that's not necessarily the case. What we really found in this literature review is that it depended on the soil structure. Um, bulk density, decreased across the board, but there was a greater decrease in bulk density in the finer and medium textured soils. Um, and there just really has been a lack of studies in general. I mean, only one of the studies looked at field capacity and permanent wilting point, and only two of them worked at, looked at hydraulic, saturated hydraulic conductivity. Less than 20% of these papers, so only eight papers, reported microbial biomass carbon, which is a um, biological metric, and only two um, reported microbial biomass nitrogen or any other microbial property like um, the amount of bacteria or fungi, protozoa, things like that. So again, there just was not a lot of data. This is just one study that I really wanted to point out that I thought was really interesting. So in this study in 2007, it was a three-year study on loamy sand. And I've kind of included these um, bar or these separators just to show. So we've got liquid swine manure that was broadcast compared to no amendment um, at three different rates. And then there was inorganic fertilizer. And then, and this was on one crop, I believe it was corn. And then there, there was a second crop. And if you look um, at the, and they're applying the same rates of nitrogen across the board, um, you know, so you can compare apples to apples. And there was a much greater increase in microbial biomass carbon in the inorganic fertilizer treatments compared to the liquid spine manure treatments, which is really interesting because in almost every other study, increase by adding manure, you're adding carbon, which leads to an increase in microbial biomass carbon. And it could be that um, these authors took it back to one idea that, um, the, I mean, the crop did a little bit better in the, with the inorganic fertilizer. And so you were adding more, um, more crop biomass back to the system, which was carbon. But again, it just wasn't straightforward. When looking at the other studies that were done, the majority of them did increase microbial biomass carbon, but again, it just wasn't across the board. It really depended on the study design. And so the, the next slide, um, and then click, yep, soil health properties are interrelated. Yet only one study evaluated the impact of swine manure on all relevant soil health properties. So there was only one study that had um, some physical, chemical, and biological um, properties. And some things that we thought should be included in, the, in future soil health studies were initial soil data. It was shocking the number of studies that did not have all of the initial soil data to say, you know, the what happened when you applied manure. And there were also um, in a lot of inconsistencies in the methods used to analyze soil samples or even those were missing from papers. And there were not necessarily the same soil, chemical, physical, and biological properties that were assessed in these studies. 
And then moving on to the next one, these were all manure related studies and yet not all of the papers included a lot of detail on the manure type, how it was applied, what rate it was applied, um, the total carbon and nitrogen, the duration of the manure application and the timing. So we had to really dig and there was missing data pieces. Granted, every paper had some components of this list, but it didn't necessarily include everything. So we were also unable to say, you know, the percent of total carbon that stayed in the system because there just wasn't enough information given, which made this net meta analysis really difficult. And then um, we also advised that there should be a detailed description of the inorganic fertilizer used in the study and even um, trying to balance the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium uh, rates, and then the duration of the inorganic fertilizer application, and then the timing of that. Um, and so on the next slide, we suggested that those nutrients should be balanced for NPK to compare the effect of manure to inorganic fertilizers, especially when you think about crop yield and soil health. So a lot of these studies, either, you know, extra nutrients were applied because it was manure plus inorganic fertilizer, or um, there was you know, the, the manure treatments ended up being shorted on a couple of the nutrients because they were just adding it at a certain rate and not necessarily based on the nutrients or it was based on a nitrogen rate and there was way too much fertilizer and potassium um, and some more care, uh, at least a few studies on that. And then to focus on the short and long-term impacts of a single application to identify optimal frequency for improving soil health. And then also those longer term studies to build carbon over time. Um, and then the last piece is further discussion relating these research findings to management decisions that are relevant to agricultural crop producers. Because the one theme that we continually noticed was that, um, you know, the there would be a lot of manure applied, you know, at a nitrogen rate. So there's a lot of excess phosphorus that's applied. And then the findings or, you know, the management decision is don't apply this much nutrient, this much manure for crop producers. And that's not super helpful. And so what are, um, can we fine tune those recommendations a little bit? And then the last slide that I have is just the acknowledgements. This, the funding was provided by the National Pork Board. And then we had a lot of help um, finding sources and organizing them. Thank you.